Okay, now our guest today, a former Republic of Ireland international, he's now an underage coach at Celtic, making his way in the coaching game at the moment. And his career started at Celtic via home farm, made his senior debut there at 19. Champions League games followed against the likes of AC Milan in the San Siro at 20. And his career took him to lots of interesting places, not least Toronto, Ukraine, Mumbai. And he finished up back in Scotland in 2019 after three years with Dundee at the age of just 32. He also won 20 caps for Ireland. He was part of the Euro 2012 squad under Giovanni Trapattoni. I am talking about Darren O'Dea. Darren, how are you doing? Thanks for making time for us. Not at all. I've got plenty of time to spare. <laughs> Where are you at the moment? Glasgow? Yeah, Glasgow. Yeah, I've been based here from, as you said, playing days at Celtic. So um, Glasgow's home now. It must start to feel a bit like home. I mean, you've spent probably most of your life there, pretty much, if you add up all the years, getting, getting to that point. Yeah, it's probably not what uh, my, my parents would like to hear me say, but home is Scotland now, um, is Glasgow. Obviously, my whole family is back in Ireland, and Ireland's a special place to me, but I've been here for nearly 18 years now, so well over half my life. Uh, so uh, wife, kids, uh, certainly in my life, so always been here, and our house is here, so right. Glasgow is, is my first home, and, and Ireland's now taking a back seat to that. Is the wife Scottish? Wife Scottish, yeah, so met her, obviously, at a young age. I was 19. We've been together for, I don't know, 13, 14 years now, so um, still going strong. We had Packy Bonner on the show a couple of weeks ago, and when he went home to we meet his future wife's father, it turned out the father was a massive Rangers fan, which... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't, have, I didn't have that problem, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, what kind of city is Glasgow? I've never been. Uh, Any time it comes up in my line of work, it tends to be about what a fishbowl it is for footballers. And obviously there's the old firm rivalry, which can have more than a bit of an edge. That's, that's really the only context Glasgow comes up when I'm talking to someone about it. What's it like to live there? Yeah, it, it, similar to Dublin. It, it'd be a, Dublin's changed a lot since I left. So I left 17, 18 years ago. I feel like Dublin's a rich city now. You go back and it's, it's actually a fantastic place to go. And if you were if you were traveling it's somewhere you would say where I feel like Glasgow is maybe a little bit of a throwback to when when I left Dublin it's it's a little bit similar to that. Um but as I said as I said it's home is is I suppose where you where you want it to be and um because I've spent so much time here it's where I'm comfortable. Um and obviously my family, kids going to school here. Um but it's similar to Dublin. I wouldn't say there's many, many differences. So uh, I don't think you're missing out on too much not of uh, not envisaging it yet yeah it can be a strange thing when you leave home early or when you leave home at any stage in that you obviously aren't native to the city that you pitch up in and then equally once a certain amount of time goes by when you arrive back home in Dublin you're not quite part of that in the same way as well often immigrants or people who lived away from home can talk about that weird sense of dislocation in both cities yeah, I probably had, so when I first came over to Glasgow and was playing, every time I flew home back to Ireland, I felt like I was landing at home and the, the just the small things of hearing the accents, the people's the accents was always, I loved, I still do love that and that feeling of, there's obviously Ireland's very special to me, but now that's the feeling I get when I land in Glasgow from coming back from a holiday or, or um, playing abroad, wherever it may be. It was probably a period in my career when I was I was traveling to and playing in different countries that um, I was in between. I'd lived half my life in in uh, Dublin, half my life in uh, Scotland. That felt like I was from nowhere. Um, but certainly now, as I'm older and obviously married with kids, Glasgow is is where I feel um, I feel home is. But I still have a very kind of special feeling when you go back to Ireland as well. Where was home in Dublin? Monkstown, um, so I was out on the south side of the city um, and obviously, as you mentioned, playing for Home Farm was a big a big commitment. It was obviously a fantastic club, um, but it didn't really make sense. I still, to this day, don't really know. Well, I know how I ended up there. It was, I was just offered, they were short in players and I, I filled in when I was about 11 in a kind of friendly game and things took off from there. But I should have probably played at St. Joseph's uh, was the, the obvious option. Um, so I used to get collected from school um, with a kind of packed lunch, sent on the dart myself out to uh, Pear Street and get off and 
walk and meet my dad's uh, my dad from his work, and then we'd then travel out through the rush hour traffic from town to to Drumcondra, obviously, and play and train. So I was it was a big commitment. So I was doing that twice a week and took up a lot of time. And um, <laughs> looking back, it was fantastic. I loved home farm so much. Uh, appreciation that I got to play there. I don't know why I did it. Um, <laughs> made no sense. St Joseph's a fantastic club. Yeah. It was literally down the road for me and Sally Noggin, so it made no sense. But uh, listen, it worked out well. That is madness. Madness. <laughs> Fair play to my dad. My dad was obviously working from working in, in town and, and had to. We were probably getting home at the back of 10 most nights, half 10 on a Tuesday and Thursday. And then obviously, then on Saturdays, it wasn't so bad because the traffic wouldn't be as bad. But like Dublin rush hour was a nightmare. Um, and then I even think getting on the dart at 11, 12 years old. It's not, happening today. I, it's not happening today. No, no, my kids, my kids are certainly not getting on any train before the age of twenty-one. Uh, <laughs> so change days, but brilliant, brilliant experience, and um, I suppose it, it kind of, it kind of probably stood me in good stead that it was a commitment and I had to stick to it. And don't get me wrong, I love doing it, but a strange one. Yeah, home farm obviously has such a rich, rich tradition going back however many decades. Did anybody else from your age group make the trip across? Yeah, so. We were home farm, as you as you well said, is is renowned um, for for producing um, international players. But there was nine of us that went abroad from my team. Wow. Um, so you'd the ones that would people would be recognised. Myself, Chris McCann was in my team. Um, Owen Garvin, who played as Owen Garvin's dad, Jerry was the manager of the team. Owen played at Crystal Palace and Ipswich. But three play, uh, three. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Yeah, three players went um, to Ipswich. So Shane Supple was was in our team. Owen Garvin and uh, a boy called Michael Sinnott. And then there was four of us went to Celtic at the same time. So myself, Dermot O'Carroll, Gareth Christie and Gary Walsh. And the four of us lived together in Diggs. And probably without the, the, the three of them going over, they, they made the, the move to Glasgow much easier for me. Um, and we helped each other. And then Chris McCann was another one. Uh, they went and obviously played at Burnley and, and over in the MLS later in his career. Um, so we had a fantastic team, a really, really special kind of group of players that um, a lot went on to have careers. You must have run riot in the DDSL for a couple of years. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, no, we had a real strong team. And actually that year, that age group was a strong age group. There's a number of players. Johnny Hayes was playing for Cherry Orchard at the time. Yeah. Um, Ian Morris, who had a good career and is now manager, obviously, at, at, at Shells. Um, he played for Lourdes, well, St. Joseph's and then Lourdes. There's, there was a, a good few players that came out of that league, or that age group. Um, the home farm, yeah, we were the strongest, so we, we would usually win the league, uh, the cup, and then the All-Ireland as well. The treble was always, I think we maybe did it two years back to back. So it was a special, a special team we had. Yeah, I'd imagine so. When the offer comes from Celtic, I think it's around 2003, you've done your junior cert. The leaving cert is vaguely on the horizon. I mean, increasingly I think maybe it's similar to the getting the dart analogy but I think parents are less inclined for their kids to give up their education and put all their chips on the table and, and head off across the water was there any discussion in your household were you academic as well was the leaving cert talked about or was this a fairly straightforward decision Celtic have called I'm going no it wasn't straightforward at all I think the way you've described it would be for the majority, that's straightforward. A club like that wants to wants you to come and play for them. You go. My mum and dad were huge on on my education, and I wouldn't wouldn't say I was academic, but I was someone that if I put my mind to it, I would have I would have come out of the leaving cert with a with a good score and um, a good amount of points. Um, so education was a massive part of me signing for Celtic. That was discussed. I, I ended up going to college when I came over to Celtic, and a lot of the boys that 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 did things like that, did cooking courses, basically tick a box exercise. I did a business management course. Um, I was alone in that, which was, which was tough. Um, but no, it wasn't straightforward in the slightest. And, and coming to Celtic wasn't just the size of the club. I had, I had offers from a lot of different teams. Um, but the reason Celtic was, was important was the family I was going to live with was fantastic. They were uh, husband and wife that took us in, but they, they treated us like their own kids. Um, so the support we had where, at the time, David Moyes was manager of Preston. I could have gone there. Leeds, Leeds were semi-final of the Champions League at the time. David O'Leary um, had an option to go there. But uh, both of them were, you were sent into kind of fantastic facilities at Leeds. But 
all players lived on the campus. Right. Now, at that age, 15 years old, to be living alone, even even in that environment, I looking back now, it was definitely the right decision to come to Celtic, not only in terms of the size of the club, but the 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 grounding I had and the type of family I was going in was a huge part of that, and then the education side to it as well. Okay, were you did you go over as a defender? Sort of. I can I kind of. I think uh, when I was signed, I was seen as either going to play as a centre back or as a, a central midfielder. Um, but probably, I actually think they fancied me playing midfield. But quickly, I don't think I ever actually really did. Um, so I think that in their head, they maybe were going to look at me in that in that area. But uh, it never really transpired. I ended up playing centre back, and I think even if I had been tried in midfield, it would have always been the case that I would have fallen back in there. Mm. Um, but that's something obviously at now coaching with younger players. I think being flexible to play play in different positions is is an important thing to be able to do. And like even coming through at that age or in in that period even in comparison with 2020, like even there's been another quantum leap in terms of the scouting, which is now global, and you can have the very best of Africa, the very best of Asia, the very best of Ireland, the UK, America. Was it predominantly Scottish boys and a couple of Irish, Welsh, English maybe thrown in 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 your day? Or how competitive was it at that stage? Um, To to be honest with you, Probably it's not changed all that much. You're, you're absolutely right in terms of the scouting network and the. there's probably more at reserve team level. There's more of a, it's a more multicultural. You'll still find with the, the team I managed, the under 18s, largely English, Irish, maybe, um, well, and of course, Scottish. Um, so yeah, I was, I was in with, uh, obviously there was the four of us Irish lads there. There was a couple of English guys um, and then majority Scottish. Um, but one of the reasons I, as a coach now, it's fantastic that this we're the size of Celtic that you can go and, and look at players from from all different um, backgrounds. But I think if you look across the board, I'm not talking about Celtic. I mean, in English football and and Scottish football, the percentage of foreign players that break through academies is very limited. And in my opinion, that is because they're leaving home. Um, so I look back and think, right, great, I did great. Um, I, I don't recommend it. I don't think it's the right thing to do, to take someone out of their own family home at 15 years old. Um, I encountered problems. I got through them, but the majority don't. And becoming a footballer is tough enough as it is without having to deal with with the world before you really should be. So um, I, would, I would encourage Irish players, of course, <laughs> Maybe probably shouldn't be saying this because there's certain Irish players will be looking to take the Celtic, but I wouldn't be against any Irish player that turned around and said, no, look, I want to finish my leaving cert, stay at home and play in the League of Ireland. Do what Seamus Coleman, Shane Long, Kevin Doyle, these guys did. And, and you see these guys, when, when I see them coming over to England, they have fantastic careers. You see Shane Long, I think it's um, just signed a new deal at Southampton and similar, say similar age to me, the same age as me. But they're humble guys. They've, they've got a real good ground and they know where they're from. They know what they're about. Then when they come into finance, which they've all come into, they seem to be wiser with it. Um, now, that does not that's not right across the board. There's plenty of clever guys that have made the, the jump over at an early age. But I like the thought of, of players staying at home as long as they possibly can. What problems did you encounter then? Just homesickness. Um, like it, 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 Kind of a funny story, but it just shows you how manic it was. My first ever salary that came in, I rang my dad and, and was going crazy saying they paid me wrong and he, and he was saying what, what's happening it was, I'd been taxed I didn't understand you, you were taxed didn't understand tax I was 15, 16 years old why would I understand that um, then having to pay bills budgeting so every month my, my money I, listen, I wasn't on loads of money but I certainly didn't budget my money was gone within five days a week of the month because I'd go out and buy a new tracksuit, a pair of trainers. And then we were in digs, as I said, and there was four boys in the digs that were bringing back to Ireland at least once a, a day. Um, and back then it cost a fortune to do that. So every month we would, we would be given the itemised bill and we'd have to highlight in our own colour our, the number, our numbers and, and then pay, pay the digs lady. She, who, she did everything she possibly could, but that was something like the bills were coming in at three, four hundred quid. Um, and we were obviously paying out a hundred each, um, 
So it's simple things. It wasn't, I, I couldn't have been in a better environment, but you're 15, 16, you shouldn't be out of your house. Um, so simple things. So, um, uh, and then you, you start to question whether you want it, when, whether you want to be there, you miss your friends there. They've got a social life that you want to be involved in. Now in the grand scheme of things, you look back and go, just put your head down and you've got a fantastic opportunity. You don't think like that when you're 16. Um, so I was lucky, but I, I, I like the thought of, of what kind of, as I said, James yeah. Coleman, Jane Long, them type of boys did. Yeah, I think it looks like an, an increasingly attractive route for certainly the parents, whatever about the kids. I guess it's hard if Manchester United are saying, come on over oh. at 15. I mean, that is tempting. Uh, for all the kind of little um, initial stumbling blocks, which are all natural, debut at 19 for Celtic and then even Champions League at 20, as I mentioned in the intro, that looks like you sailed through reasonably well in terms of technique, uh, in terms of promise, in terms of how you were rated there. Did you always get the sense you were going to make it or, 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 or you know, was it more down to graft and, and hard work? Talk to us about your route through to suddenly pitching up in the, the San Siro 20 because from afar that looks like, oh, well, this guy almost sailed through in so much as anyone can. Yeah, so when I came over, and, and this is something I'm, it's, it's not a story I tell to younger players. It, it's genuine. It, when I first came over, yeah, of course you have a hype. You're coming over from Ireland. Yeah, I was highly rated, a big uh, potential in me and was seen in me and I felt it. But the initial buzz of coming over and the excitement and, and um, yeah, and buzz you have for coming quickly goes away within a few months because you realise this is reality and this is your life now and it's not just a it's something to tell your mates that you're overplaying for Celtic. This is this is real life, and you're giving up your life for it. And I probably I progressed really, really quickly in the first year. I just took to it like a duck to water, and I went away when I was I think 16 with with Martin O'Neill, and went away to America with pre, for preseason with the first team. With back then was Henrik Larsson, Chris Sutton, um, Neil Lennon, the manager now. Mm -hmm. um, so really, they they'd obviously. I think it was two years previously I'd, I'd been in the UEFA Cup final, so a really successful team. So I, I flew for the first year and then I hit, I hit a real... When I say a lull, I was where I probably should be. I was in the round of reserves, playing the, ahead of my age. But I, I kind of, because it accelerated so quickly, that, that lull hit me hard um, and I probably lost my way a little bit um, and just got into a, I suppose... I wouldn't say bad habits, but just going through the motion, going through the motion of going to training, trained well, always trained well, went home and, and that was it. But then it, the penny drop when Gordon Strachan came in for me um, and it, it, it just shows you that a coach's comments sometimes can change your life. He just said he loved fit players. He was big on fitness. So I went home uh, to, to Dublin um, for the summer and for the summer, I just ran. All I did was run. And I, I lost, not meaning to be, when I came back, I probably lost. Now, I wasn't overweight, but I lost nearly a stone in weight. Um, and I never weighed myself, so I wasn't even aware that. You came back in and people were kind of a little bit, they were nearly thinking I was ill because I was gaunt, because I was just been running so much. Back then, there was no, it wasn't about uh, running for five minutes, stop for five minutes, rest for I ran till I felt ill. And then when I was feeling ill, I knew I was working hard, so I'd just keep running till till basically I fell over. Um, and that was honestly my mindset. But that that really helped me because when I went back in pre-season, I flew and I was running past everyone. And that impresses a coach and a manager. And off the back of that, I trained with the first team. And don't get me wrong, then you're, you get your opportunity, you have to take it. So I spent the time with the first team training before I eventually played and then games that you're talking about coming up when they came I look back and think that there was an enormous amount of work before the end and um, of course I was nervous and and you enjoy the occasions but I was ready I was ready and I'd done hard yards before I got there and um, so that was one thing that I look I always look back and think I was there was other players as talented as me if not more talented but I certainly I would have matched anyone in in how I worked good man there's a drive there so there is, um, I, I, I would think you can vividly remember those runs and the pain and feeling sick and keeping on going because you're probably, you're so in the moment and you're so alive at those times and you have such a, a drive and a focus. I, I've no doubt you can remember those runs. I can't, yeah, I can't. I used to run around, like there was no, like now I've just been out to run myself and you, if you're, you're Apple watching, you, you've got yeah. to know how far you're running, how quick you run. I didn't know, how, I never knew what, how long I was running for or where I was running even. I just ran. 
and um, there was pitches off the back of the housing estate I was from I'd sometimes just run around them and run lengths of it I, there was no method really to it but um I look back and, and without without jumping kind of too far ahead yes. that was something that that the reason I probably retired as young as I did was when I for for a lot of my career certainly at Celtic I was known as one of the fittest um even for so in a center back I was a little bit unique in that way I was known as a really really good runner um but what people didn't see was Scott Brown being an example now he's still going strong he was a freak of nature he'd roll up after his holiday he, don't get me wrong a good professional but he was just naturally fit I wasn't naturally an athlete right. um I had obviously compared to maybe Joe Soap in the street I maybe a nat- more natural ability but in compared to football I wasn't naturally an athlete but I was on the face of it. So when we went into pre-season or we did runs or any fitness test, I was always at the top. And people thought I was a brilliant runner. I wasn't. I worked extremely hard. So for my whole career, I was at my limit all the time. So Scott Brown, I, one of the reasons now he has such a prolonged career and goes on is, or I look at Ryan Giggs, 40. There's no chance I can do that because Ryan Giggs wasn't, maxing out all the time he was looking after his body but he was naturally had that athleticism I probably didn't have that and had to fight for a little bit more um so they then miles and hard yards I probably felt harder than than maybe a more naturally gifted athlete very interesting uh, your Ireland debut like we'll skip around here because we you've had such a mad career we won't we won't we won't um, get everything are your parents there for that like break, playing for Ireland that must be a huge one yeah so down in I was down in Limerick. Uh, we played South Africa, I'm sure. So came on for for 30 minutes, and I was a little bit I was a little bit ignorant to achievements in early on in my career, probably all the way through my career, and it's still in my makeup now that I don't ever sit at the time of something and go, oh, "That's brilliant." Mm-hmm. That was something though I did. I remember that night feeling just that was brilliant. So making my debut for Celtic and even Champions League, I, I took that in my stride and thought it was the norm. This is the norm. This is what I'll be doing for the rest of my career. Um, but that was always something big to me and it was for my whole career and it's not something I, I, obviously it was an honour to play for Celtic in particular of all the clubs I played for but no it, it didn't match anything near playing for Ireland and I can honestly say every time I played for Ireland was was special so um, I don't I don't know if my, my parents were down I don't feel they were because mm. um, it was down in Limerick I'd probably been in other squads and, and not come on and I think I got the last half hour of the game or whatever it was and um, but that was something I look back, yeah, and, and was just so proud. Every one of the claps is, is something that I, I love. I love the fact that I can say I've done. Yeah, and 20 times and many squads as well. What was Trabatoni like? I mean, I guess you, you maybe you think about him even slightly differently now that you're going into coaching. So in, in hindsight, was Trap good with you? Did he, I mean, maybe he doesn't spend that much time with you because you're not always in the first team. What was that period under Trap like? It was fantastic. It was fantastic for me in terms of now, in terms of coaching. I would take certain things that he did. Of course, how could you not? Mm. Um, his style of play is obviously not something I would coach, and, and certainly not at Celtic. He couldn't. Um, but I certainly wouldn't believe in a lot of the kind of things he did. Um, but he was fantastic. He was a guy. He, he had a real kind of uh, fighting attitude. He loved players that he loved players that were passionate and wanted would do anything to play for the country so he was big on people pulling out or he was loyal he was loyal so if players constantly showed up they would usually stay in the squads and he, he wasn't he wasn't one for for well I think he was renowned for not really watching all that many games and he sometimes there was clamor for getting a player into the squad and it would take them ages to get in yeah I think he was very very loyal and I was I was no doubt I was um I benefited from that but there was there was a couple of moments in my Irish career that that uh, built that relationship between the two of us. Um, there was one playing we went and played away in Macedonia leading into Euro 2012, and the do- I'd I'd picked up a really bad um, ankle injury, and the doctor Alan Byrne, who's probably by far the best doctor I've worked under, just was saying there's no chance he can play, and Trap in Trap argued tooth and nail. Um, and there was a bit of an argument, put it that way. But I played the game, um, and then typical trap, we went and ended up playing in Belgium in a friendly four or five days later against Italy. And he, he sent all the more senior players away because it was the end of the season. 
and he insisted I played again. Now that was pointless. The doctor was actually saying at the time there was potential to break uh, or fracture my ankle. Again, he insisted, and I was that I was very ignorant to injuries when I was younger. I just thought I was desperate to play, so play. But after that, the, the relationship bonded. He loved it. He absolutely loved the fact that I would play with an injury that, and he'd call. He constantly called called me a warrior, and his staff was the same. Didn't speak great English. We wouldn't have exactly sat and had conversations. But once he trusted you. That was it. It was very hard to. It was very hard for. Um, it was very hard to get him to trust you. But once he did, you had that relationship, and I benefited from that because there were good players, probably at times playing a higher level than me. And um, by any time, Sean St. Ledger was a great example of that. Was always brilliant for Ireland, but his club career at times was a little bit rocky. But he kept John O'Shea at right back for for a lot of his career, where John was probably more suited to playing at centre back. Um, mm. But that trust with with Trap was a big thing. Euro twenty twelve is a funny one. Like, Croatia, Spain, Italy. So, you know, like, it was an outrageously difficult group. And yet, there's no doubt that the wheels came off a little bit. Various players have talked about different things. Uh, I remember Keith Andrews talking about, and Stephen Hunt's made this point as well, just, it's probably the most prolonged period. You were all together. A lot of traps. Training was very repetitive. Um, I think Keith talked about the hungry, friendly in advance, and he felt his legs were empty. And just... Uh, an incredibly different group, but the team didn't give a great account of themselves either. And I was there, even working at the time, in the hotel in Sopot. I mean, you guys couldn't leave the hotel because you're right in the middle of um, <laughs> this town and it's full of Irish fans and just um, didn't quite work, obviously. So what's your overriding memory of, of Euro 2012? Um, I can't say because of the because of my career, like you look at maybe someone like Robbie Keane or Damien Duff was there, I can understand um, they've been to multiple tournaments. To me, it's something that I've just delighted to go and be there. And um, there was things that weren't right. Funny enough, I've, I've just spoken about today with, with one of the papers back in Ireland. Nice. Um, there was stuff not right. There was the families. We arrived and went for a walk, the players in the first night and, went to see where our families were going to be arriving the next day or in, in, a, in a week's time and the hotel was above a, a lap dancing place and it was chaos then we were all scrambling around because obviously the hotels we couldn't get people into hotels and I had my, my now wife and daughter coming over and um, then there was yeah you're talking about the hotel. I, I don't get me wrong I, I, I can't remember specifically but I probably moaned about the fact that the fans were downstairs and you couldn't move you loved it in the other sense, though, with the buzz of getting on the bus and you could you were scrambling onto the bus and the fans were going mental and you're singing. And I, I, I'd never been into another experience, so I assumed that was the norm. And um, I didn't mind that as much. Um, the, so the way Trap trained was people people assume that when they say he was doing the same thing and, and repetitive, that he was working with us tactically. He wasn't. He, we we basically did the same training session for the full five years he was there. We we had a warm-up, we did boxes, and then we did a two-touch game. That was it. So when we had arrived for a, a normal qualifier, you'd be there with each other for anything between five and ten days. A lot of players are coming off the back of a Saturday game or a Sunday game. Some of them got knocks or niggles or have specific ways to recover. So training was perfect. It was, it was, it was always lively. It was competitive. And it was a bit of fun. It was lighthearted, though. The players took it seriously, but it was lighthearted. Mm. Very little tactical work in it. When you do that for 40 days straight with no days off, that's where I think the... I don't think when Keith talks, and Keith can speak for himself, and he's, he's sure. well capable of it, I don't think Keith would have felt physically fatigued. I think he was mentally probably just drained of doing the same thing over and over again, and, and you didn't have that spark to you. And Irish players, rightly or wrongly, are sociable. They're sociable people. They want freedom at times, whether to be and go and have a beer, which people would say, oh, going away to the Euros, you should give up your life for 40 days. Trust me, everyone was willing to do that, um, but it just didn't work. Um, he even said that he roomed with Stephen Ward and they got on very well, but he said somewhere in the midst of it all, we couldn't stand the side of each other. We had to go in different rooms. Like It was just like cabin fever. Yeah, so... Me, I was me and Aidan McGeady were, were roommates for that and for all my international career. Um, we got on great, me and Aidan, but um, and we probably didn't have that moment because we were used to being each other, with each other all the time anyway at Celtic. 
but just some of the habits I look back that we created there were just your sleep patterns completely uh, screwed up as well because you were finished probably for one o'clock every day because yeah. you train in the morning after breakfast and that was you I used to remember sometimes you would have to take um, sleeping tablets to get to sleep because we couldn't sleep because we'd been in our bed all day and as you said we couldn't really leave the hotel and we were in Hungary and Italy and there wasn't much to do and um, you end up becoming lethargic. Lockdown, lockdown's a little bit like yeah. you become lethargic yeah. when you don't do anything. And, yeah. I, and that's where I think Keith, and again, that's just my opinion, when Keith talks about being, feeling kind of leggy in the game, I honestly think it, it's because you're not active. And mm. Irish people, and knowing Keith, Keith's busy. He's, he's just constantly on the go. And I would have been the same as well, that I, I wasn't one to be lounging about. Some players... People say Duffer, for instance, was was someone that loved to sleep. Now, that was a, a little bit of a myth, but maybe he did enjoy the kind of getting away from everything. So players are different, but Irish people, in my my kind of experience of them, was they, they needed to be, be out, they needed to socialise with each other. And I don't mean in terms of going for, for a drink, but even a coffee or being in the lobby or whatever it is, being locked in your rooms didn't suit the culture. Saying all that, again, in my opinion, only my opinion, we got beat by just three teams that were in a different planet to us. Um, and I don't think the, the build-up really... I think we could have given a better account maybe ourselves, but the guys did a lot, did everything they could. The, the three teams we came up against were, were just far superior. Yeah, well, you've, you've the two finalists and you probably have the best international team. Uh, definitely of your playing generation and, and quite possibly beyond as well. And like, you know, Trap being Trap, Pearl, Glenn Whelan and Keith Andrews, two against three in midfield. Best of luck, fellas. Yeah, I listen. I, I I look back and you can. You know, I looking back and I'm genuinely do fondy and and I used to. It was it wasn't the central midfielders I used to feel sorry for. It was the wingers in the in the way we played because they were the most attacking outlet for us and had to be covering the length of the pitch and hit the box in in all aspects from the opposite side. Um, but then when they defended. Trap was absolutely anal about them doubling up with their full backs so they covered length pitch. Liam Lawrence was always the one that stuck in my head, not for the Euros, but just you'd watch Liam Lawrence and after and he was a fit guy, Liam looked after himself extremely. I used to watch him after 20 minutes in a game. I was thinking, he's gone. Right. Gone physically. Now, to be fair, it was just his makeup. He could go for the full 90 minutes. But the, the wide guys and our midfield four had an extremely tough time in that system. Yeah. Um, and Robbie being the the extra man, Robbie, was obviously a centre forward that was a goal scorer, so he wasn't maybe as, as naturally um, defensive. He's not, he's not going to drop back. He's not going to drop back and oh. put in a ten k shift. No, and and but from my point of view as defender, we were we were protected really well, so yeah. it helped us out. And we went, I think it was before the Euros. We I think we went nine games with nine clean sheets in a row, and nice. we had a really serious defensive record. I think looking back, it's not surely it's not far off a record. It was like nine clean sheets, or clean sheets in a row and we can see the one goal in 11-12. We were defensively very good and listen, you didn't need to be a rocket science. That was the way Trap set us up was to be hard to beat. Yeah. I do remember, I'm not sure which game it was, it was probably the last game so that would have been maybe Spain and the fields of Athen Rye are blaring out and it's 4-0. I think to be fair, the general sense of the fans was, look, we're not going to bail on the team now or turn on the team now. We kind of get we're against different level opposition here and we've had a decent run. So, you know, I, I remember Roy Keane, I think on the TV was saying, oh, we're coming here for the sing song. And that was part of the talk at the time. And, you know, the Irish attitude needs to shift. And I get what he meant, but I thought it was, I thought it was kind of a mature thing, actually, that the fans, of course, they wanted to win, but didn't turn on the team or throw their toys out of the pram. I don't know if you remember sitting on the bench for those games, but I, I do vividly remember Fields of Athen Rye at 4-0 down. I, no, yeah, I absolutely do remember them um, very well. And that's something where I maybe see it differently. To I, I completely understand where, where Roy is coming from, but yeah. I don't agree. Um, club level, I do. See, at international level, I always thought myself is, for what it was, you were, you were representing people. You weren't representing a club or you weren't getting paid to go and do it. You were representing people. So um, I would be seriously offended if an Irish fan base and, and that's one thing that they're renowned for is the backing they always give the team I'd be offended though if they ever did turn and, and booed or or because unless they thought the players weren't given their all which I think that, that could never be thrown at any Irish team in any generation the players gave everything they had were beaten by better teams 
it was it's always very much appreciated as a player the support you get um in the national team but on the same hand i expect it because now i was a kid and i grew up supporting these guys some of them i got to play with i was very fortunate with and now have gone to the other side i would always support the irish team i would be very very um it's your country it's your country you don't have a choice you don't have a choice not you're going to move and, and support someone else so i kind of I'm quite quite strong in that this you went it wasn't always and that's something that kind of without going on a rant about it it's something that I, I, I'm not big on this kind of chasing after players to play for your country and to build it's the best 11 players that are desperate to play for your country and, and that honour to go out and play at any level in football or any other sport is is for me is, is sacred so um, no yeah. that, that, that sport I do remember it very well and it was appreciated but I didn't expect anything less yeah. So, uh, Proviso, Trap's a legend, obviously. I'm not, not trying to turn this into a, a, an anti-Trap question. But the likes of, say, you mentioned players earlier who the media certainly felt should be in the squad. Wes Hulahan jumps to mind, and that was a no-brainer. The likes of Seamus Coleman wasn't in the Euro 2012 squad. Uh, do you remember, did, they, did, did the players, when they're sitting around having a cup of coffee when it came to Trap, were there grumbles in a sense, ugh, some of this stuff definitely isn't right or was there a general sense of look this guy knows best and we're happy and we're content and, and we'll follow him no matter what he says I think you probably find the them type of conversations would have more you might have got from the senior players now I don't know if they had them they certainly not not in my experience so Stephen Hunt I'm sure could speak and Keith Andrews they would have thought about things a lot more they were more experienced um, and then of course the the real senior guard of Robbie and Damien and, and Richard Dawn, Shea Given, mm. they might have. I was in the younger bracket to it. I you, were happy, with, you, were happy, you were happy to be there, understandably. I was. I was happy to be there. Um, I was never had an ego. I never rolled up to, to, to the camps and thought, I'm definitely going to play or I should be playing. And, and I also knew the pecking order, which, was, which helped me a little bit. So it was Richard Dunn and, and Sean St. Ledger. And I managed to make myself third choice. So... John O'Shea he could have clearly moved John O'Shea at times and, and brought in a Seamus Coleman, which I'm sure many would have argued probably should have done. Um, and I'd probably argue that, but <laughs> he didn't. And um, so I knew my pecking order. So I was always big on when I was before the camps I saw. I, I genuinely would do it and I would never hope for it, but I would look and Sean St. Ledger as he got through 90 minutes of the game. And if, see if I saw he hadn't of the Saturday, my, my eyes would light up and I'd think, right. But even if I didn't, I always enjoyed going into the to the camps and. I liked, I look back now and I'm delighted I've made the most of it because to go and play with, as I said, th these were genuinely guys I'd supported as a kid. Um, mm. Bobby Keane, Damien Duff. So it was, it was brilliant playing with them and training with them. And they're brilliant guys as well. So them type of conversations probably did happen. Um, but I was, a, if you want to call it a disciple of trap, I was there because he believed in me, he trusted in me. And then to have someone of that experience and that arguably one of Europe's best ever managers in terms of success and the teams he's managed to have him believe in me I wasn't going to question any he did now as a coach now I look back and think I wouldn't do that I wouldn't do that but I can't look back as a player and think he was anything but good to me mm. the, the, where your career gets kind of uh, unusual then obviously is like post 2012 that's where you, like you take off effectively it's it's Toronto I had to write it down just to make sure I had the order right Toronto 2012 to 13 13 to 14, you go to Ukraine, in Donetsk in Ukraine, and then it's Mumbai where Nicholas Anelka is the manager. That is the road less traveled. So was this a philosophical, I want to see the world kind of thing? Was it uh, money? Was it crap offers in the UK? Some kind of combination of, of the no, three? If right? you actually look, if you look, so I, I, I was leaving Celtic. Um, I want to first team football. Of, yeah, I'd come off the back of playing for Leeds because I was on loan for my last season at Celtic yeah. I played 40 40 odd games for Leeds um, I'd been named albeit probably the oldest young international player of the year for Ireland how old were you? But I think I was 24 25 <laughs> but saying that I think they were I was, as, I was as young as you were getting in the squad um, that was I, the think we're, I think we pushed it out further saying, I think it's an under 30s award now at this stage <laughs> I, might, I might still have a chance of winning it one day again <laughs> um, so yeah so, but but in terms of my career I was in a really good moment I was going away to the Euros I didn't play but sure. I was in the squad and 
Uh, as I said, I was I think I played just under half the qualifying games was was very much a big part of that. Um, and my agent, I have to admit, the Euros itself played a part in it. I was he was ringing me regularly and when I was in camp and and saying X, Y, and Z or or have offered you this, and I was like, no, not for me, not for me. And eventually, once I came back from the Euros, um. I probably I can't remember the amount of time, but I kept saying no. I had so many different offers from the UK, and I kept saying no. And financially good packages, they were. I was get I was getting paid, and I was getting offered what I should have been getting offered. Put it that way. Um, and my agent one day turned around and said, "I don't I don't know what you want. I don't know." And it wasn't that I was thinking I was better. I was going to get something better. I just I don't know. I, I really and I, I kind of need to be careful because it sometimes sounds like I'm slagging the league off. I never enjoyed playing in the English Championship. It was it, that, sorry. That's where a lot of the offers were coming from. Yeah. Um. I was. Ju- I think I played nearly a hundred games there, and it was just monotonous. It was brilliant players, brilliant clubs. Like the clubs were phenomenal. I got to play with Reading, Ipswich, Leeds, Leeds in particular. Um. But it was like Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. I was physically you were yeah. exhausted it's all the grind. time. It's a grind, yeah. And and Toronto came up, and I was just offered to come out and have a look. Went out, had a look, um, and I just loved it. I loved it, and it's probably the happiest, one of the happiest years of my life in terms of football and combining my own personal life. It was just brilliant. And now we go. We were just there last summer. Holiday was in Toronto. We have family friends out with the football, and um, they come and spend Christmas with us. We go over there. Brilliant, brilliant city. Um, and once I went there, in all honesty, then it became about financial. Um, I realised. I, I kind of looked to come back to England and you were kind of out of sight, out of mind, that type of thing. And Ukraine, oh, sorry, not from Toronto, Ukraine. When I went to Ukraine, I drifted out of the international team, which can't have any complaints. Martin O'Neill came in. He's hardly going to be watching Ukrainian Premier League. But the funny thing and a bit of frustrating thing for me was when I was in Ukraine, I was at the peak of my career, no doubt. I was physically a machine. I was technically improved because I was playing with with there was six seven Brazilians in our team who were some of the best footballers I played with different style of football I was I was at my peak and I couldn't expect to be involved in the national team and no one in Britain knew that no one in if I if I went back and played in the English Championship I'd have done very very well at that moment if I'd have played in the national team I'd have done very well and after that I I picked up a bad injury that um, ended up seeing me drift a little bit because I had to leave Ukraine because of the unrest mm. and then I ended up drifting a little bit and eventually play with my, my feet back in Dundee. Right, okay. There's always those sliding doors moments in so many careers, aren't there? Um, and then there's no way for your agent to orchestrate some kind of move or get some kind of YouTube footage to some championship club, take a punt. Uh, yeah, no, like, listen, my name was, at, at that stage, at 20 international caps, I played at Celtic, I played 100 games in championship. Yeah. It wasn't a case of, of trying to put my name back out there. That that That's why I'm saying it became financial. So I, Okay. I look back. I cringe a little bit. I had a couple of people, managers or, or chairman, ring me and and offer me to come in, and and some of them offered me contracts and ugh, dismissed them straight away. I wasn't interested in. I have to admit, for probably probably that period, certainly when I went to India, I was I was done. I was done with football. I kind of I just wanted to earn what I could out of the game and and support my family, I suppose, and. India, again, turned out to be a fantastic experience. It's something that I'm delighted now, but I'd be lying. India, I thought my ankle, which I'd broken coming out of, of Ukraine, I thought I was done. I'd been out for six months. I went to Blackpool and played 20 games there where Blackpool were shambles, but it was a marriage made in heaven because I needed to get fit. They were in the championship. I played 20 games and I knew I was going to leave. But um, Alan Byrne, it, through all of this, Alan Byrne and Celtic rehabbed me because I had to leave Ukraine with a broken ankle. Mm. So, forever grateful to, to Celtic and Alan Byrne. Um, but he was bringing me back to Ireland regularly to see uh, Steve Eustace, um, who's a specialist and fantastic guy. He was was seeing me and he was injecting my ankle with, with different steroids to settle it down. But at the end of the season in Blackpool, to, to kind of give you a scale of where my ankle was, he, he, he had a scan of my ankle and asked me how long I'd been injured for. And I said, oh, I'd, I'd played the, the previous day. It was the last game of the season, the previous day. And he said, I can't believe you've walked in here, let alone you've played wow. a game of football. Okay. So I was, I was again, I was I injected it. And I, I went to India. It was a three-month league that paid good money. Um, 
for three months. I thought I'll be able to, but funnily enough, in India, I re again living in a hotel, I rehabbed a lot. I was in the gym a lot, built up my body again, my ankle and the strength. And I got back to a relative level that I went back and then ended up at Dundee and played three and a half years. And yeah. I could perform to a decent level, but nowhere near the level I was at kind of in my mid 20s. Okay. How does a Scottish dressing room versus an Indian dressing room versus a Ukraine dressing room versus a Toronto dressing room compare? And that is the first time I've ever asked that question. Yeah, probably the last time you asked me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's some smattering. Yeah. So the, the, the kind of British style dressing room is. When I say it was my favourite, it was probably just because I was used to it. It's sure. a little bit cultural, you hear, but it sounds like, I think when you hear stories now and, and certainly the kind of awareness around mental health and it get, takes a bit of a batter and it's, it's nowhere near that. It's fantastic. It's, it's funny, but you'll find there's loud characters in there and I probably was one of them. Um, I loved being in the middle of things and um, I, I loved being in the dress room and, and being around um, friends, I suppose. Toronto was, was similar, but but just a lot softer. Um, boys were very sociable and uh, it was good fun. It was a little bit different in terms of the banter they would have together. Um, and then, obviously, then the extreme was then going to Ukraine. Ukraine was silence in the dressing room. Um, players were very much got on with their own things. So in the training ground in Ukraine, we all had our own bedroom. So we had a room with an ensuite and TV and everything. So you'd come into the training ground, I think it was three hours before evidences every day, get your blood pressure, your heart rate and your weight. Then you go up, you'd maybe, we had, the training ground was surreal, it was huge. You, there was uh, snooker tables you'd go to, there was a bar, obviously no alcohol, but bar, you get a coffee and, and a wee snack, bring it up to your room and maybe watch a bit of TV for a couple of hours. Socially, um, you'd kind of, you'd just meet up when you got to the pitch train and then that was you. Um, as I said, there was a lot of Brazilians, so I, I, I was always the one that was, I was the same guy, I was a, trying to kind of create a bit of atmosphere and one of the nicest things that was said to me was when I left Ukraine the, the director the um, technical director there said it was the, I was the first player he'd ever seen bring the the different cultures together um, because I was constantly I, listen if you didn't want to speak to me I was speaking to you um, and as you well probably know I can, I can speak so um, I love speaking to people I love being around people and um, so I kind of was someone that, that bonded the squad a little bit yeah. and India again India the whole squad, including the staff, lived in a hotel. This luxury, I mean, top, top luxury hotel. So, again, there wasn't a dressing room. We arrived to training, trained, and then went back and um, and had our own rooms. And we, I socialised probably with the, in Ukraine with the Brazilians. And in, um, in India, there was a Spanish kind of group that I kind of clung on to purely because they, they all both spoke English. Um, Getting to know the other cultures was was one of my favourite bits. So getting to know Ukrainians and Russians, cold, very cold to start with, very hard to break down barriers. But once you did, brilliant guys. Yeah. Um, Indian people, really kind of soft nature, didn't didn't maybe, they wouldn't be make the first step with you because they were a little bit more timid and, and standoffish. But again, a fantastic culture of people. And then through the mix of this, there were Serbians, Dutch, um, Cypriots that I played with, that I yeah. ended up being really friendly with. So probably something that, taken massively from my career into coaching is is been able to handle different cultures and backgrounds and accepting people for for what they are and, and there's a million ways of being as a person and and I feel now I'm very very that's a strength of mine because of the traveling I did as a player I'm sure and in the midst of all this so you, you mentioned you met your your partner at 19 so I presume she's with you for a lot of it is it a happy time. I mean, are these great adventures and you're enjoying it and and, and you know I'm, I'm, this is a great career. Or is there any sense of, oh, maybe the hopes, ambitions I had are slipping through my fingers and it's gone from, you know, one club to another and bloody civil war here and that there. Like, what, what, what's your mindset like during these five, six years? Yeah, at, at, at certain times, like, so moving to Toronto for the first time is a big deal. Um, moving, moving the whole family over to Toronto and then all of a sudden... You're a year in, and, and, and as, as I said, we ended up settling well, but that's really daunting. That's a big, big deal. And we, our daughter, my daughter was two at the time. So, um, and then moving to Ukraine was look, I look back in Ukraine and think, what a brilliant experience, but I hated every minute of it while I was there. I was, it was a seriously tough time. It, um, it strengthened me a lot, to be honest with you. And then a civil war kicked off, so I couldn't be with my family a lot of the time towards the end. 
Um, but we, we hit a moment. I don't know exactly when it was. I'm, I'm, it actually changes as people, and I'm, and I'm kind of going to sound a little bit, um, a little bit kind of romantic here. But I kind of, I kind of built up a, a mentality of what will be will be. Um, I used to be a worrier, and one thing I was was the, kind of you touched on ambitions of slipping through hands. I never. I, I'm, I'm a very kind of pragmatic person. I'm, I'm ambitious, but I'm pragmatic. So I actually consciously knew when I left Celtic, I'm never going to play at the top level of the league again unless it's it's out with of Britain. So I wasn't I wasn't thinking I'm going. I wasn't the guy from X Factor that gets four X's and says I'll be back with a Christmas number one. I was like, oh, I think you're right, lads. I'm off. <laughs> so it was, it was about the experience for me at that stage. So I wasn't. There was never a moment I thought. So see, when I went out the national team. I didn't go, that's my international career. I was like, I should have been out of that team months ago when I was in the MLS. I wasn't playing at a standard where you should be in the national team. So I was very pragmatic with these things. So we worried a lot, but we look back now and I think my my eldest daughter, she's lived in Ukraine, she's lived in Toronto, she's visited Mumbai. And we look back now and think, that was brilliant. Um, And we probably at one stage did realise, as long as we've got each other, we'll be all right. And at the end of the day, I was getting paid quite a lot of money to go to these places and play football. I think maturity maybe um, helped me with that as well. So the kind of answer to the question was, it was tough at times, really tough. But as we kind of went with this, and we, we very much got that attitude now with what I'll be would be my coaching career. If, if it takes me abroad again, so be it. Um, if it doesn't, one thing we do appreciate and one thing I didn't appreciate when I was at Celtic, I appreciate the club. I, and then touching on younger lads living at home, living in my own house now and going to work and coming home, bringing my daughter to school, collecting her from school. There are things I didn't appreciate as much as I do now, mm. but I still think football is brilliant life, but it might take me away again and I'll be, more, I'll be more than open to that as well. So why coaching and when coaching did you decide that that was for you? Um, I decided the, the day I signed for Dundee, um, not so I signed a short term deal from the when I left Mumbai in the December once the league finished and then I signed a long term deal well say three years from that summer onwards in 2016 I think it was so that moment I knew it was to align with doing my coaching badges and then taking uh, sessions with their reserves and their under 18s so that was the moment I made the conscious decision that it was for me at the time I was doing bits and pieces in the media and I really enjoyed that um, and I did actually flew down to London for a period of time and was commentating on MLS games for Sky. Sky, um, But I was basically just watching it on a TV down in, down in I think it was Heathrow. Um, so I enjoyed all them things and that was the time I was starting to think about the next steps. But I, I absolutely loved coaching. And I, I kept thinking in my head, play as long as you can because that was drilled into me and you hear every footballer saying it. it. So it was kind of my last year, my contract, and I was getting offered... Um, different things to, to obviously keep playing and I, I genuinely I didn't want to play anymore I was looking forward more to, to the evening um, when I was going to go and take a session than I was going to to train and touching on to the earlier part of the conversation I wasn't a guy who was like that I loved training I loved yeah. running about and being a footballer I loved it where I genuinely I can hand on heart it sounds wrong but I was going out to play games thinking I don't want to be here anymore um, and it wasn't a case of still play to a a high level but I just didn't have the hunger and that fire just completely went but it wasn't it didn't go in terms of there was nothing in me it was just so much in the other side of it I wanted to coach um, I found myself becoming probably a little bit too opinionated at times um, because I was thinking all the time um, so in all honesty that was that it was something that I thought would happen whenever my body gave up on me but I found, I found well why, why do I have to wait till and why do I have to do what everyone else does and play as long as you can because I did have the option to keep going and I, I, I admire people that do that but I, I, I look back now and there's not one bit of me that misses, misses playing Wow that's amazing and you're, for people who, who don't realise you're retired at 32 because it is the ultimate cliche you keep playing until you can't play anymore like I just I don't I, I see the appeal of coaching but equally like playing is the ultimate I would have thought. I, I, I don't know how that cocktail of adrenaline and going out in front of a crowd and expressing yourself on a football field and the joy of winning as a team, like you're, you're almost a little bit, 
bored by it, indifferent to it, just I, I, I'm not driven towards it anymore. Like I, I presume in the midst of a 90 minutes, you're still totally engaged with a game. You're not, you're not thinking to yourself you're, during a game, Ugh, I, I'm not feeling it that much anymore. I'm, this is the, probably the bit I love. I'm quite, once I set my mind on something, I'm very, um, well, my, my, my wife would call me, I'm obsessive with something and coaching would be certainly in that bracket. So you're talking about I'm engaged for 90 minutes. I'm engaged 24-7 now. My head does not switch off, and mm-hmm. I quite enjoy that. Um, I'm constantly thinking, where's a player? Part of your job was to rest and to to sleep and to basically essentially just look after yourself. Yeah. Um, again, any player that ever says you can't replicate playing and coaching, I completely understand that. I get that. I far, and, and I mean this, more enjoy coaching than I did playing. Um, the, the one thing I would say is that buzz of winning a game um, and coming off the pitch with your teammates was probably the best feeling in football mm. um, I loved coming home from a game to, to my kids and, and sitting in the living room watching Saturday night TV but, and you've won a game you just have this feel of satisfaction the feel, I've I'm only at under 18 level and, and it's my life now is developing footballers and the result isn't the, important at all really but I've still got that satisfaction and, and see you've been part of actually arranging a team and arranging a group of, of guys to go and, and play a certain way seeing it to me is a far greater um, I get greater satisfaction out right. of it. and probably one of the things and, and talking about this is me being very pragmatic I'm always I'm very uh, say I'm very self-aware I'd like to think I'm self-aware but I do I, I didn't think I had natural abilities as, as a footballer I had certain natural abilities but a lot of what I, I got as a footballer was graft, serious graft, and, and I talked about that comparison of Scott Brown being naturally more of an athlete or yeah. a Damien who's a naturally a gifted footballer and he, of course, these guys added the work ethic to it. I didn't feel I had them natural bits in coaching I do and in management. I've got uh, a slight bit of arrogance about me that I think I've got natural ability now if I match it with work ethic. I, I've got big ambitions to go and, and, and I'm saying that's with me being pragmatic. So I live my life for this now. I love it. Um, mm. But again, I get I get the majority of footballers plays on each can. I probably advised that to to players as well. Um, but my overwhelming feeling was I had to I had to stop um, because my my attention was no longer playing. And listen, I was playing at a high level, but you had your full attention had to be on it. My I would I would argue saying my last season, I was just so much much more engaged when it was taking a session rather than um, wow. rather than actually being in it. You're lucky, Darren. You're literally the first sports person I've, I've talked to who had their love of their primary pursuit overtaken, superseded by something else. So you've landed on your feet there. How does this all work now? As in, okay, a lot of people, this, you know, un, there's, a, there's a certain tier. Stephen Gerrard can walk into the Rangers job because he's Stephen Gerrard. Okay, so you have to start at a different level entirely. How does the route up work? As in... Uh, under 18 do you have to do something very special do you suspect with the under 18s to get I don't know what coach with a senior team and is it like are we talking would would Scottish Premier Division assistant coach is that the next step like you're not going to suddenly jump to a Premier League senior setup I would think and, and how does it even work like is it word of mouth because you're an under 18s coach like someone in the Premier League who's looking for maybe a young assistant at senior level isn't going to be watching the Celtic under 18s how does this world work now yeah, it's, it's and this was something again I was massive on, um, and something I would tell young players if you're going to say you're going to do something, then, then go and do it. So when I was retiring, I was very big on mapping out a plan. Yeah. And um, now, quite clearly, seen from my my playing career, that wasn't the plan. Um, so maybe I'm not a good planner. That's the first thing. But no, my plan was so when I was coming out of the game, and, and there was a few. I actually had a couple of offers. Sorry, to go back to the question, sometimes it is word of mouth a little bit. Yeah. Obviously, been on the licenses, you meet people, um, you make relationships just through football, you make relationships as well. Um, so I had two offers to go into first team um, coaching roles. Um, now, not one was at a, was at a, a high level and, and one was at a, at a lower level. Um, but See, my instinct I, there is take the high level. Just get, get, yeah. get in as high as quickly as you can. So... And I spoke to managers uh, and ex-players and they all said, um, take whatever job you can, learn it, learn in the job and, and develop basically. But I have a clear clear goal of where I want to go at the, very, at the kind of 
and this is at the top top level so how do I get there I figured and this is just my own belief and thinking mm. was I have to work in an elite environment if I want to be an elite level coach I have to be able to coach in an elite level way now I wasn't going as you well said I wasn't going to be able to go and be a first team coach in elite level straight away so I'll go back to under 18s and I look at the 18s now as a similar reflection to myself they're guys that are aspiring to go somewhere they're working every day to improve and um, I'm kind of a mirror onto them as much as I need to be able to do my job right now which which is is the most important thing I'm always looking to to get better and, and make the steps so um but the big thing for me was to be in the elite environment to work on in an elite way all the time because if you want to be an elite manager I'm, I'm fed up of hearing managers tell me and again I'm, I'm going to sound critical some of these are some top managers that I'm talking about but they say you can only manage the players you've got you have to manage to their strengths you have to play to their similar to what Trapattoni maybe did with Ireland um, I get that I understand it but their jobs are on the line and that's maybe there's no manager in my opinion that starts off saying I'm going to play pragmatically we all start off saying we're going to be this expansive playing nice attractive football that scores loads of goals I figured well I've not learned that way. Um, so when my job's on the line, will I stick to my beliefs and principles that, that I've got? It's easy for me to say that before I went into coaching. But when I get to that moment, I will. I will and I'll, I'll play in a certain way. I'll have beliefs and principles bedded into me as a coach and a manager that if my job's on the line, so be it. This is the way I'll play. Um, and it, it, you need to have an element of, of course, you need to evolve all the time and, and learn and, and develop. But, and I look at the elite level coaches, the top ones in the world, they have these principles, but yeah. they didn't coach in a different way when they were, they didn't all of a sudden get to the top and say, right, I'll coach that way. Now they coach the whole way through. Brendan Rogers has been a, a great example of that. And um, so uh, it's my mind. It's such a tough industry though, because you, you're going to have to steal yourself to being called naive. Like even Pep Guardiola, after all he had done, like when you think about what Pep Guardiola had done, he had to sit in press conference after press conference at Man City and have journalists tell him, well, you can't play this way in England and that's not, you know, it's not working and you're naive and, you know, uh, a lot of chairmen will bail on, they mightn't bail on a Pep, they might bail on a Darren O'Dea a bit quicker. Yeah, absolutely. So makes it all the more so to your principles. They need to be right. Um, but if you believe in them, if you believe in them, then th these won't be questions in your head. You might, you might lose your job and being a manager now, you will lose your job, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but if you want to work at the top level, essentially you call it you hear word philosophy but a blueprint i think top teams or most i think it's filtering down now they they don't just buy the manager they buy the actual blueprint that comes with it yeah and um, so i figured that if, if i can do this at 18s level and then build to the next level and the next level that's kind of the path now listen i don't know where my next move will be i'm certainly not looking at that just now it could be as a first team coach it could be a reserve team coach I don't. I certainly don't visit. It'll be a manager um, anytime soon. That's not certainly not part of the plan. Um, right. Because these these principles and beliefs I'm talking about take will take a long time to to practice and and study. And then uh, along the way, I'm all the time. I'm I'm trying to to learn and see other ways of doing things. And I'm not just talking about in football and in other sports and business and anything to develop uh, basically as much knowledge as possible. So when the the time comes, and as I said, I, that's the way I look at it. When your neck's on the line. What are you going to do? Because one thing's for sure is you're going to have to be clear and everyone will look to you as a manager. You need to be clear in what you're going to come back with um, and you need to have the answers. So um, I suppose you're, you're, you're going back to the start and saying, right, I'll, I'll go and learn. I'll learn from scratch. Right. Amazing. Have you been in with any Jurgen Klopp types or Pep types or got to watch any serious operators at training? I'm very fortunate, obviously, at Celtic. You're... you're any day I get the chance, which is... There's, there's regularly the chance where I can come in and... And lean on the staff there, Damien, who's obviously who's who's obviously going in with the national team now. Brilliant coach, and obviously had the relationship with him was was great with me. Mm. And John Kennedy, funnily enough, the, the actual first team staff there, John Kennedy and the manager now, I've played with them all, and um, so I've great relationships. I go and can watch training or whatever. Bren Rogers was someone that, that I went and, and had a relationship because I played for him at Reading, um, and then off the back of that, I went in and, and spent some time with him. Um, and spent a few hours just kind of picking his brains on things. So, um, but th that's something I want to do as much as I can. Um, and, and I've done that and gone to a few other clubs um, and seen how they work. And then I'm big on, on going outside of football as well, other sports. Um, 
and, and business as well because essentially when you're a football coach um, or when you're a football manager, you, you, what you're doing is you're managing people. Yeah. So some of the business people around the world are, are as good as anyone at doing that. And I, I look I look at Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp and I think of how good they are in, in terms of the football element, but the, there's a buy They have a real uh, relationship with players. Now, I know some of it people say is for cameras, but there's no doubt when they go into a club and, and I've looked back in their careers, that's been from a very early age. They've got a personality that people want to play for and that's just as important as any tactic you'll have is, is having trust with people and players and how you manage them. So that's something that, again, I'm trying to develop. Good man. Wow. I didn't realise that's where you were. That's really exciting. Listen, we've taken up enough of your time. It's been great to chat to you about your career and maybe get a glimpse of the next... 10 years and beyond, hopefully. So, Darren O'Dea, under-18 Celtic coach for now. Thanks a million. Brilliant. Thanks so much.